Magdalena Bazalova Carter from the University of Victoria, and uh, I'll be very happy today to talk to you about flash radiation therapy in X rays. So, just so you know, this was this is not going to be just my work, um, but this is going to be uh, basically an overview of flash radiation therapy with X rays. And it's not definitely going to be my work. If it's going to be my work, it's going to be the work of my students. So, that's very important to note. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation to present at the uh, McGill Medical Physics uh, Unit Seminar or Friday Noon Talk, as it's known. And uh, if you're a student at uh, the Medical Physics Unit, know that uh, McGill Medical Physics Unit is great. And I really had a great time at McGill. And uh, as was uh, maybe mentioned, I am a McGill graduate as well. And uh, thank you for the opportunity for me to reminisce about uh, my time at McGill. So you all know uh, this picture way too well. For me, this is just a reminder that I could have been in Montreal right now, but uh, thanks to the pandemic, I'm not. Notes that um, you know, PhD or your studies can be a little tricky. So sometimes you feel like there is too much work or too much snow. So that definitely happens to me as well. And after McGill, I moved to Stanford. So I definitely missed the snow afterwards. And while PhD, you know, can be a lot of work, uh, we also had a lot of fun at McGill. And this is uh, from a photo from an AAPM meeting. And you might recognize both people, but if not both, you certainly recognize this person. And I still don't know what kind of conversation we were having there, but clearly we were having a lot of fun. And uh, after about four years, uh, I was able to finish my PhD. And this is a proof that I am indeed a McGill graduate. So thank you, Medical Physics Unit, for all that you have done for me. And I really appreciate uh, having been a student uh, at McGill. All right, so let's move on to flash radiation therapy. I'm sure all of you probably heard about flash radiation therapy one way or another. Basically, what we are trying to do is to deliver the radiation dose, possibly the entire radiation dose, we don't know that, uh, in a very fast way. Um, so we are thinking about delivering the treatment dose in uh, less than one second. And of course, that might pose some issues, and maybe not some, but a lot of issues. We really don't know how to do this clinically. Uh, but one of the issues would be, of course, uh, imaging. We really want to make sure that we uh, deliver the flash treatment in the right moment and irradiate the targets and not the healthy tissue. Um, so just an example, we missed the targets. Now we possibly, possibly hit it. I will not be talking about imaging today, uh, but note that flash radiation therapy, while the concept you know, sounds really intriguing and exciting, and some people think that this might revolutionize radiation therapy, there's still a lot we don't know about flash radiation therapy. So how it came to be, really, there are studies uh, about um, delivering of uh, radiation therapy you know, in a fast fashion in, under ultra high dose rate, dating back to 1960s. Um, but it wasn't until 2014 when in the study by Favodon et al, they actually presented a reasonably rigorous study in vivo, that means in small animals. So what they have done, they have looked at uh, delivery of radiation with conventional dose rate, and their dose rates were about 0.03 grade per second and flash dose rate. And at that point, they basically postulated that the dose rates could be about 40 grade per second that will achieve the flash effect. And also know that flash, the flash effect is a radiobiological effect, and that's the decrease of normal tissue toxicity while the um, con tumor control remains the same during flash radiation. Uh, in their paper and their following papers, um, the flash radiation therapy was delivered with 4.5 to 6 MeV electrons using high output Linux. So what did they present in their study? First of all, they looked at uh, tumor control for head and neck uh, uh, orthotopic tumors, I believe. And they have looked at uh, the uh, tumor control uh, as a function of days after treatment. So let's, follow, um, let's uh, focus here on the blue curve, which is uh, 19 and a half gray conventional radiation therapy and the purple curve, which is um, 20 gray flash radiation therapy. So similar doses. And you can see that the tumor control um, or the suppression of tumor volume after treatment is very similar for the two dose rates, which you know, is um, exciting. But what's more exciting is the normal tissue um, toxicity. And so this is a plot of uh, normal tissue toxicity in terms of radiation-induced slug fibrosis uh, at four time points after treatment, but let's focus at the 36-week time point. 
And let's focus at the 17 gray flash radiation therapy shown in the second column and 17 gray conventional radiation therapy shown in the third column. So these are the different levels of uh, lung fibrosis, post-radiation therapy. And you see that for the conventional radiation therapy, all the mice exhibited some degree of radiation-induced lung fibrosis. For the same dose for uh, flash radiations at dose rates of 40 gray per second, only about 30% had a mild or very mild uh, case of uh, radiation-induced lung fibrosis. So this is the reduced normal tissue toxicity after flash radiation therapy that everybody is, well, okay, almost everybody is so excited about. And if you're still not convinced about these uh, toxicity plots, you can also look at this photograph of a mouse that was uh, irradiated to 20 gray uh, with flash, and you clearly see the hair pigmentation in the thorax area that was irradiated with flash. Uh, but there's no epilation or skin ulceration, which was the case for conventionally irradiated um, mice. There are many other studies that followed, uh, mostly with electrons, um, some with protons as well. But this is the first patient um, that was uh, published, that was treated with um, flash radiation therapy. It was a 75-year-old patient that had uh, cutaneous lymphoma. The patient was diagnosed in 1999. Uh, and treated over 110 times for various uh, ulcerative and painful cutaneous lesion which were progressing despite systemic treatment. So uh, Jean Borges, who is the lead author on this paper, picked one lesion that was about three and a half centimeters in diameter and treated this lesion with flash radiation therapy to 15 gray in 90 millisecond using one of the high output Linux that uh, I introduced on the previous slide. You can see that at three weeks post irradiation at the peak of skin reaction, there was um, no, some skin reaction for sure, but uh, supposedly uh, less skin reaction than after conventional radiation therapy. At, and at five months post irradiation, the lesion nicely healed. And I think there might be a follow up study on, on this lesion at some point. Okay, most flash radiation therapy has been shown or demonstrated with uh, electron beams. And I'm just gonna show some of the examples. So this is one of the riotron or kinetron beams that the first number five perhaps studies were conducted with. It delivers uh, electrons from in the range of four and a half to six MeV. You can see the depth dose curve for a one pulse irradiation achieving dose rates of about 10 to the sixth gray per second. And for a conventional dose rate of one, one gray per second, you see that there are defenses in the depth dose curve for sure. Um, but for the uh, non one pulse irradiation, they were able to achieve 500 gray per second. Note that this machine is clearly not a machine you know, dedicated to treatment of patient. This is a machine that was developed for non-destructive testing. And now we are thinking about using it on patients. So there's another uh, type of deliveries that have been uh, achieved uh, using clinical linear accelerators. There's a number of ways how to modify a linear, linear accelerator in the clinic for the delivery of um, ultra high dose rate radiation therapy. And this is the work done by Stanford group in which they rotated the gantry to 180 degrees, basically get it the system, get uh, their animals as close to the uh, source, to the target as possible. And they were able to achieve dose rates of 74 gray per second using nine MeV electrons running in the uh, high dose total skin electron mode. And most recently, uh, at the beginning of this year, perhaps in February, this was published, the Dartmouth group presented yet a different way how to convert a very unlin act for the delivery of uh, ultra high dose rates at the ISO center. So what they did, they basically removed the target um, and ran the uh, machine in photon mode. So as a result, you don't convert photons into electrons and you're getting very high dose rate at the ISO center. And compared to the Stanford group, who was able to get 47, 74 gray per second, you know, the, um, at the location of the mirror, the Dartmouth group was able to measure 240 gray per second at the ISO center. Uh, so much higher dose rates and also much higher beam sizes as a result. But I'll get back to this machine at the end of my talk. So why people are, have been using electrons and not photons, which is the, um, the topic of my talk, well, if you think about the linear accelerator and how photons are being generated, we accelerate an electron beam and then we have it interact with the tungsten target or a high atomic number target and generate X-rays uh, through Bremsstrahl production. If you look at the stopping power as a function of energy um, for tungsten, for example, which is a common target for linear accelerators, 
And let's look at uh, the 10 MeV electron that interacts through radiative uh, collisions and or radiative um, interactions and collisions. And for this 10 MeV photon uh, electron, um, about 50% of the energy of the electron is converted into radiation, and that's what we want. But the other 50% are converted into collisions that eventually result in heat. So you have to be very careful about not to melt the targets if you're trying to get a lot of X-rays out of a uh, Rems challenge target. Now, as we know, not all of these X-rays go in the direction that we wanted to want them to go. So we lose some of the efficiency of the electron to photon conversion right there. And perhaps a little less known fact is uh, when we look at the dose in terms of grade per particle for photons and electrons, we get about 20 times more dose uh, deposited by electrons of the same energy than with photons. So all in all, if you think about that, we get about one to 5% efficiency in converting electron beam dose to photon beam dose. And you know, that's a very low efficiency. You can think about increasing the beam current by a factor of 20 or 100 to get the same dose with X-rays, but then you would almost certainly melt the target. And if you think about the possible implications for a patient treatment, these could be huge. And we certainly don't want to do that. So this is the main reason why we have not been using photons for flash radiation therapy, but rather electrons. So can we use photons? Like what are the, the various sources uh, that we can use for um, photon radiation? So of course it's the um, uh, typical Linux that deliver doses of six grade per minute on, on the SRS modes, 10, 10 grade per minute, but these are grade per minute, not grade per second. So we are trying to get about 40 grade per second. Uh, for um, the true beam machine that uh, does not have the flattening filter, we get about 24 grade per minute. Of course, we can make this a little higher by moving the uh, sample closer to the, to the target. If you look at HDR machines, uh, they deliver about one grade per minute or so, but we'll, we'll talk about those as well. So it's a bracket therapy source. Uh, but we also have synchrotron sources, and they seem to be pretty um, interesting sources for flash radiation therapy because they can deliver about 10 kilogram per second. And yes, these sources actually have been used for flash radiation therapy, um, but let's talk about you know, how they are being generated. Synchrotron radiation can be useful. It's not always useful, but it can be, and it is generated when a charged particle is moving on, uh, accelerated on a circular path. Uh, so this is a uh, photograph from the Canadian light source. So we also have a synchrotron uh, X-ray source in Canada, which is very exciting. And this is the formula that shows us what is the uh, energy loss per turn of an electron uh, being accelerated on a circular path with a radius um, R. E is the electron beam kinetic energy, and E naught is the um, rest mass of the electron. Um, for, for example, for the ESRF source, uh, which is in Grenoble in France, um, the synchrotron radiation is coming out of six GeV electrons being accelerated or stored in a storage ring with a radius of 134 meters. So obviously, you know, these machines are large and not very practical for radiation therapy in a clinical setting, but they are sources of X-rays of, of high fluxes. And here, this is the plot from our upcoming paper uh, on flash with X-rays, and this basically shows us what is what is the brilliance of synchrotron sources compared to X-ray so X-ray tubes um, as a function of um, um, time um, in uh, in years. Um, and we see that, of course, synchrotron radiation is uh, getting of uh, higher and higher brilliance, and uh, possibly more useful for flash radiation therapy. So as I said, flash actually has been demonstrated for uh, with X-rays using synchrotron beams, and that was done um, in the study by Pierre Monte Cruel, um, in which they irradiated brains of mice to 10 gray with flash and conventional radiation therapy, and uh, flash was delivered at the ESRF um, beam line in Grenoble, and uh, it was not delivered as a uh, single beam, but it was delivered in as is, in slices and uh, which is a thin beam of you know, probably five to 10 micrometers. And in slice, the dose rate is about 16 kilogram per second. But since the brains had to translate through the beam, the mean dose rate was about 37 gray per second. Conventional radiation therapy was delivered on the small animal radiation research platform that delivers 225 kilovoltage um, KDP X-rays. So they performed a cognitive studies at two to six months post-radiation. 
and uh, they recorded the recognition ratio, basically showing the cognitive function of the brains of the mice. And at both time points, you can see that the recognition ratio uh, was similar for flash radiation therapy compared to the control group, but the conventional radiation therapy uh, resulted in lower recognition ratio, meaning that the brain function was um, decreased uh, for mice irradiated with conventional radiation therapy. And they also performed BRDU staining to, staining to identify proliferating cells. And you can see that there are more proliferating cells in the flash radiation therapy uh, than in conventional radiation therapy. Um, and that was um, you know, even higher for the control group. So that was, that's very positive. So maybe we can uh, perform flash radiation therapy with x-rays. Uh, however, in the same year, there was a study by Smart et al. Um, that performed similar irradiations, although their focus was on microbeam radiation therapy. Uh, and they were performing these uh, irradiations at the Australian synchrotron. So they have <clears throat> done a number of irradiations um, uh, and the dose rates were 37 to 41 gray per second. Uh, let's not focus about uh, on the microbeam therapy, uh, but let's focus on the conventional radiation therapy and what we can call uh, flash radiation therapy shown in dashed lines. And you can see that for total body radiations, the survival uh, the probability of toxicity was very similar for flash radiation therapy and conventional radiation therapy. And for abdominal partial body radiation, you could say that flash radiation therapy actually resulted in higher toxicity. And in head uh, partial body radiation, um, again, the um, probability of toxicity was very similar between conventional radiation therapy and flash radiation therapy. So it was in a way a controversial study that did not show the, the flash effect. However, the definition of dose rate is uh, probably could be slightly questioned. And um, um, yes, so, so basically this, uh, this study did not show the, the flash effect uh, with synchrotron radiation. And also the uh, synchrotron radiation was delivered differently uh, than in the study by Pierre Montegro. So the issue with synchrotron beams is that there's, as I mentioned, there are large facilities and there are not too many um, in North America or in general world, worldwide. So that brought uh, my group to actually investigate whether or not we can deliver flash radiation therapy. And by that, I mean rather ultra high dose rate radiation therapy with conventional X-ray sources. And that stemmed from <coughs> our pre uh, previous research on the uh, high energy physics experimental beam line that I'll talk about uh, on the next few slides. So what we have done, we have uh, looked at basically our X-ray tube and other X-ray tubes and we're trying to see if we can deliver dose rates higher than 40 degrees per second, if we position the radiation sample basically right at the surface of the X-ray tube and we do not use any, inher any filtration for the beam. So first we ran Monte Carlo simulations of the uh, X-ray tube in EGSNRC mode. And uh, we did that for two different tubes, the one that we have in the lab, which is the MXRN16022, but also another higher power X-ray tube to the MXR165. And you can see the dose rates uh, shown over here and the while the Z scale, I suppose, goes up to 120 gray per second and up to 150 gray per second for the, for the other MXR165 X-ray tube. So the um, result of this was, well, there is a, you know, quite a large dose gradient uh, on the surface of the X-ray tube we are getting high dose rates um, and definitely higher than 40 gray per second on the surface of the X-ray tube. However, since these beams are not uh, filtered uh, by any filtration, we just use the 0.8 millimeter beryllium window uh, that is uh, present in the X-ray tube. Our beam is very, very soft. So we have a large proportion of L-shell tungsten X-rays of about 10 keV. And as a result, when you look at the depth dose curve, we actually get a very fast dose gradient. And we are able to only get um, dose rates above 40 gray per second at about two millimeters in depth. Now there's definitely a, a shortcoming of the system, um, but it did seem to be working reasonably well. Um, so we perform also dosimetry, a very quick uh, study uh, for a phantom with films. Uh, we had to be a little creative about how we have how we did that, but basically we could simulate 
the dose distribution uh, in this uh, solid water phantom at 15 centimeters and 18 cent uh, sorry 15 millimeters and 18 millimeters depth and we get a pretty good agreement um, between Monte Carlo simulations and experiments which uh, gave us some confidence that this could actually work and we should be able to deliver these uh, high dose rates you know in a very easy fashion using x-ray tubes and we don't need any expensive equipment of course, the advantage of uh, being able to run ultra high dose radio radiations with an X-ray tube is, is, you know, pretty obvious. There's many X-ray tubes in North America that could be potentially used for ultra high dose radio radiations. So, since we used a conventional X-ray tube uh, with a stationary anode, uh, we ran into this issue, and we already knew that when we were running this um, experimental validation of our Monte Carlo model is when you look at the dose um, as a function of time, what we would like to have for flash irradiations, you know, is a flash dose rate, of course, much faster that would be delivered, you know, as a basically square um, delta function, really, um, that's uh, very, very narrow. So less than, less than one second irradiation. Unfortunately, with our X-ray tube, there is a ramp up time and pull down time. So this is what we were getting. And if you're trying to deliver some, you know, a certain dose, in subsequent intervals, it was just not possible with the X-ray tube that, that we have in the lab. So we did, we what we did, we developed a shutter system uh, in collaboration with our machine and electronics shop. Basically, we we're able to um, deliver short pulses of radiation. So this is the photograph of the or a video of the shutter system. So it will the shutter wheel will be moving at two different speeds. I don't know if you caught the first one, and this is uh, the second speed. It's basically a one millimeter slit in a two millimeter tungsten wheel. And we built a Monte Carlo model of the shutter system so that we can calculate the dose uh, to a sample that we would be irradiating. And we use Topaz uh, for that. And so it was, what was our idea is basically, if you look at the cross section of the X-ray tube, is to generate X-rays and uh, irradiate perhaps cells. So we have a holder, uh, a PCR tube, 0.2 millimeter PCR tube that can hold cells or perhaps some dosimeters uh, for dosimetry applications of uh, ultra, high, ultra high dose rate delivery. Uh, so this is a system that we built. It's actually um, in sets or recessed in the X-ray tube. So we are able to get even higher dose rates than 160 gray per second. There's also some culprits to this uh, that I'll be discussing on the next slides. Okay, so we uh, collaborated with Metsynth and uh, used one of their scintillators to validate or to evaluate the, the X-ray tube-based system with the shutter. So our scintillator is a plastic scintillator dosimeter. I believe it's BCF60 of um, about 0.5 millimeters in le length and 0.5 millimeters in diameter. So we basically put the system in the PCR tube and ran a number of irradiations, changing the shutter speeds and changing the tube currents and tube voltages, and evaluated the system's linearity with beam shutter speed and with uh, tube current just to see that we can reliably deliver radiation dose to, to our samples. Um, and we ran Monte Carlo simulations to um, show, see what type of uh, radiation we are uh, expecting in the in the scintillators, this is a profile of uh, one millimeter, sorry, one one second uh, and 0.1 second irradiations as calculated by Monte Carlo and uh, as measured with the scintillator. So this is the 100 millisecond and 1,000 millisecond irradiation. You can see that there is a dose um, asymmetry in the profile, which we believe is probably because of the black paint thickness that might have varied or because of the uh, scintillator size that is probably asymmetric. We'll get back to that later. Uh, so we have looked at, um, we used their uh, older hypersynth system in which we are only able to, do, to acquire data with 20 and 50 frames per second, but we were able to verify that these two uh, acquisition rates give us the same signal. And uh, we also looked at the signal linearity as a function of shutter exposure time uh, for three different tube currents and for three different tube voltages. And we were able to see that um, these are all, uh, the signal is um, linear with the shutter speed as well as with the current, which I'm not gonna be showing over here. 
we were quite satisfied with the results. When we were comparing the doses measured with scintillators and calculated with Monte Carlo, we were actually able to get those differences of uh, you know, less than 5%, which might not be great. But at the same time, we, because of the high dose rates that we were delivering to the scintillators, they resulted in high doses delivered to the scintillators. And over the entire course of these experiments, we delivered about 14 kilograms to the scintillator. So of course, it's a very high dose. And that resulted in some output changes uh, to these uh, output decreases of the scintillator. So later on, we thought our system is pretty decent. So we wanted to evaluate more scintillators. And we started a collaboration with Luke Bollier's group at Laval University. And we have looked at um, different scintillators, plastic scintillators, and then hybrid scintillators with uh, different levels of uh, lead doping concentrations, starting from 0 0.5, 1.4 to, uh, to 5%. And uh, you're able to see you know, the difference in the dose rates that uh, was about 25 gray per second for the plastic scintillator. Of course, the dose rate, the absorbed dose increased significantly for the lead doped scintillator to about 60 gray per second. This scintillator actually had a large cap of four millimeters. And therefore the dose rates are much lower than the dose rates that were um, acquired with the previous scintillator that had a, basically just a paint uh, on, on the tip of the scintillator. Um, these are also, this data was also acquired with a new version of Hypersyn. So we are able now to acquire data of, uh, with 420 frames per second. Um, so it's about uh, three to two milliseconds um, in, uh, per data point. So this is uh, much faster and might be much more useful for flash radiation therapy as well. And as in the previous study, we uh, verified the linearity of the signal of all the probes as a function of exposure time and also as a function of tube current. And we saw exactly what we are hoping to see. And the signal was beautifully linear as well. Um, so uh, we actually went on and uh, have done more irradiations. Um, and we're also thinking, okay, now we can deliver ultra high dose rates of you know, 60 gray per second. But how about if we want to decrease the dose rate? There's a number of ways how we can do it. But one of them is basically just to move the scintillator away. So the scintillators were first positions, scintillators are samples, were first positions at 2.2 centimeters away from the focal spot. But when we move them to 20 centimeters away, the output, of course, uh, decreases uh, by a factor of about 100. And we verified that with uh, uh, scintillator measurements as well. And we can also vary the uh, tube current if you wanted to further decrease the dose rates. And it's demonstrated on these two axes and everything uh, matched perfectly. Uh, we also looked at uh, how the dose rate would look like um, on, the, on the top of a phantom that was just in front of the shutter wheel. And uh, we saw you know, this uh, dose distribution. And of course, this dose distribution is not very uniform, which is unfortunate. And we certainly have to do something about it before we start uh, any in vitro experiments. And uh, so the shutter would be rotating in this way. So you see there's no dose, uh, it's basically the shutter shaft is, and there's much higher dose uh, closer to the shutter shaft as expected because the uh, shutter slit is spending more time uh, on, the, on the phantom closer to the shutter axis. So if you look at the profiles as shown here in this red and blue curve, you see that along the uh, y-axis, the profile is reasonably uniform over a couple of millimeters, but it's certainly not the case you know, in the radial direction. Uh, so this is a little bit of a problem for our experiments. And if you look at uh, the deck dose curve, similarly to what we saw previously, there is a sharp uh, dose fall off. So we would be able to only get uh, dose rates of higher than 40 gray per second at depths of uh, about one millimeter or so. so. We are also interested in what happens if we irradiate uh, spheroids of about 300 micrometers in diameter that have been used for flash irradiations to um, see what the radiobiology behind flash is. And spheroids are basically just clumps of uh, or spheres of uh, cells. And uh, so we simulated this uh, 300 micrometer spheroids and we shifted them left and right, up and down, and basically up and down along the axis of the shaft, and so the dose differences would be. And obviously, you know, as uh, shown here in the PDD plot, when we um, displace the, uh, uh, the spheroids by only 300 microns, 
we get this large dose gradient. So we need to do something about uh, our PDD curve as well when we want to irradiate uh, cells because otherwise we will get a high dose gradient across just the spheroid. And that's something that we don't want to get. So in order to improve uniformity, we can harden the beam. Note that we are getting dose rates of about 260 gray per second. So these are very high dose rates. So we can certainly harden the beam somewhat and uh, suffer in the um, dose rates, uh, quant um, dose rate um, amounts. So that, that would be OK. And we can also easily redesign the shutter slits and you know, do that by Monte Carlo simulations to get a much more uniform profile along the x direction here. So uh, our system can likely be used for in vitro irradiations, but clearly not in vivo or definitely not for patient irradiation. So what can we do for that um, in terms of X-ray irradiations? So here I'm going to talk a little bit about the Johns Hopkins system that basically took uh, our work as motivation and um, or inspiration and uh, came up with an idea that if we put two parallel post diagnostic X-ray tubes, you know, in close proximity, we can achieve two things that we were not able to do that with our system. One of them is to um, basically get a little bit uh, rid of this uh, PDD fall off. If we have two parallel post beam, your uh, profile across an, a small animal would be much more uniform. And number two, since these are diagnostic X-ray tubes with uh, rotating anodes, they do not need a shutter system. They basically turn on and off very quickly. So this is a uh, work by uh, John Wong's group, and they have uh, built a Monte Carlo model of their diagnostic X-ray tube. And this is the Monte Carlo model validation with measurements in terms of the dose rates as a function of depth in a solid water phantom. They use Chan4 simulations for that. And this is the, the bulk of their paper is on uh, you know, the hypothetical scenario in which we have two parallel opposed beam and are trying to uh, calculate the dose rate in a water phantom. And they have looked at beams with 150 kVp beams with different filtrations to improve the, uh, the beam uniformity. And they're able to achieve uh, dose rates in, in the middle of the two centimeter phantom of about you know, 100 to 140 gray per second with a reasonable uniformity in the phantom. So this is uh, work, uh, work that's uh, in progress, but hopefully there will be a system that we would be able to use for, um, for flash or ultra high dose rate irradiations in small animals, which I think would be quite exciting. So for this, uh, for this particular system, we could use it definitely for in vitro, most likely for in vivo, but still not for patients. So how can we use X-ray beams for patients? Because that's what we are trying to do ultimately. If flash radiation therapy um, turns out to be um, a modality that we can actually apply in the clinic that we can trust, and that results in reduced normal tissue toxicity. So I thought this might be of interest uh, of, to, to your group, because I know uh, Shirin is doing research uh, on brachytherapy. So it turns out that if you look at uh, a new Iridium-192 HDR source, and you uh, look at the dose rate right on the surface of the source, you actually can achieve dose rates of 16 gray per second on the surface. So these are very high dose rate. Of course, there's again, lots of limitations like there is with our system. So this is for a 10 curie source. We can possibly get a 20 curie source that already gets closer uh, to the 40 gray per second threshold that we actually don't even know if that's the threshold, but you know, that's what we are after at this point. And perhaps if we have multiple sources, we can get higher of these ultra high dose rates of 40 gray per second. And of course we would have to devise a mechanism that would be able to uh, irradiate um, a sample with uh, these ultra high dose rates, but in less than one second. So some shielding would have to be um, you know, come up with or designed to be able to irradiate um, with ultra high dose rates using the Iridium 192 source. Now, some of you might recognize that this is a cobalt source. Um, and if we think about uh, the exposure rate constant of a, of a cobalt source and think about a 12 kilocurie source, which is a typical source, and assume it's just a one centimeter cube, we actually can get very high dose rates with the cobalt source as well. And I guess this is a source of uh, gamma rays. So we could get dose rates of about 330 gray. 383 gray per second at one centimeter, and this dose rate would decrease to 42 gray per second at three centimeters distance. 
And again, shielding again would be even more difficult than for an iridium source because the energy of the gamma rays is about 1.25 MeV. But possibly, you know, these dose rates can be achieved with a, with a cobalt source. And lastly, that's what I'll be talking about next. Uh, is uh, high energy physics beam lines that you know likely will be de delivering high output beams, and those could potentially be used for uh, conversions to to X rays. And this is a topic of uh, my other research streams on stream on flash radiation therapy, and that's to be performing uh, ultra high dose rate irradiations at the Triumph Advanced Rare Isotope Laboratory beam line or the Ariel beam line. So we have gone through a number of uh, iterations with this research as well. First, we were thinking that we would be using this uh, 300 kV um, beam line or beam dump rather, uh, but then we relatively quickly realized that 300 kV beam line, while we could potentially get flash dose rates, it's not you know, optimal and we moved up to the 10 MeV beam line. So this is the 300 kV uh, irradiation station that we originally thought of modifying. Uh, but when we, then we move on to the uh, 10 MeV beam line, which is shown over here. Um, and so, you know, the aerial beam line will eventually be able to deliver three, 30 MeV electrons. So we are all talking about accelerating electrons, of course. And uh, what we need to do uh, to uh, be able to run ultra high dose rate or flash radiations with, with photons, we need to convert this electron beam to a photon beam. And I talked about that at the beginning of my talk. So this is the 300 and um, 10 MeV electron beam line. And we're trying to convert this into a flash radiation station. And that's the project of my PhD student, Nolan S. Flynn. So what we are literally doing, we are converting a beam dump. That's basically what was used to get rid of the electron beam into a flash radiation station. It probably doesn't even sound, sim sound simple. And I can tell you, it's definitely not been simple. We have been working on this for two years and we are just about to start the installations. So first thing we had to do was to design the target. And as we mentioned, the design of a target is not straightforward. We cannot just put a chunk of metal in front of the electron beam and hope for the best because the metal would melt and it would break vacuum and people at Triumph uh, or in Canada in general would probably not be very happy about that. So we started with uh, picking up the right material. Uh, so it turns out that while in medical physics, we like tungsten uh, for conversion of electrons to photons. In high energy physics, uh, they like tantalum much better, even though these two uh, materials elements have very similar properties. Now um, we had to figure out what the right thickness of the tantalum would be, and also how to cool the tantalum target. Because as we mentioned, if we don't do anything in terms of cooling, you're just gonna burn a hole through the uh, tantalum and that would not be, again, appreciated by anyone. So we decided on an explosion bonded tantalum target on aluminum flange. And this aluminum flange would be actively cooled with water. And again, we need to make sure that the aluminum sustains all the heat, that the water sustains all the heat, that we don't create a lot of ozone. So there's lots of considerations that need to be taken into account that I had no idea had to be done. Uh, we ran uh, Monte Carlo simulations in Topaz and in SNRC to figure out what the dose rates um, in the target would be. But it also turns out that we don't need to only worry about the dose rates in the target, we need to worry about all kinds of other dose rates. And we also uh, perform finite element modeling in the ANSI software to figure out what kind of uh, heat properties or stresses we would see on the target itself so that we don't melt it. Um, so these are some of the uh, setups of our Monte Carlo simulations. We have looked at the different sizes of the electron beam, which is also a parameter and we can tune. Um, we have looked at uh, different sizes of the collimator of the target as well. Also look at doses in, in small animal models. Uh, this is a um, schematics of the tantalum aluminum target and the water channel and the cooling plug. And these are some of the results. Uh, and we looked at two different beam energies as well at 10 and uh, 8 MeV. Uh, we looked at the tantalum temperature that should not uh, surpass 2000 degrees and the associated dose rates for the different beam sizes of the electron beam. And we have concluded that the highest dose rates can be achieved for the 10 MeV beam uh, run at five millimeter electrons, uh, five millimeter beam size. And uh, this is still tantalum temperature uh, of less than 2000 degrees and the dose rates on the surface of the phantom are about 310 gray per second. 
Uh, so we're quite satisfied with that. And this is just a comparison of the beam profiles and PDDs uh, with the 300 kV beam that we originally considered. And you can see that the dose rates are pretty high and we can achieve flash uh, capable dose rates perhaps of uh, higher than 50 gray per second to depths of five centimeters, which has not really been possible with any of the electron beams that uh, people have considered for flash radiations. So we're quite satisfied, but we already had these results probably last year. And then we were trying to uh, get approval from Triumph to um, be able to install all this equipment. And we are running in more and more problems with, <laughs> with our setup. Uh, for example, we had to add more shielding. We had to um, add more shielding in the bag. So to make sure that there is no the, um, uh, shielding requirements uh, or the dose rates are satisfied um, outside of the, of the, not just the shielding um, of the system, but also outside of the aerial beam line. But what was even more interesting is that we were actually generating a lot of backscatter. And all this backscatter was uh, in the direction of some uh, diagnostic equipment, perhaps uh, important and not uh, cheap diagnostics, diagnostics equipment. So we had to modify uh, quite a bit of the beam line in front of the target as well to make sure that we don't damage any of the equipment. The target actually has gone through a number of revisions as well um, to make sure that everybody on the team, or I felt like everybody in Triumph or in British Columbia was satisfied with, uh, with our setup. And we ran lots of simulations in Fluka as well. In order to be able, for us to be able to access the animals, we are planning for animal irradiations. We also had to uh, come up with a shielding door because we need to be able to you know, and, uh, put the uh, animals inside and take them out after irradiation. And that's definitely not something we do when we are using the system as a beam dump only. So we designed this you know, heavy uh, door with all this, the support so that it's easy to move the, uh, the large shielding with lots of uh, lead blocks in and out. So we're quite satisfied with that until one day uh, somebody realized that when we actually put the shielding door uh, in the system, we're no, no longer able to pass uh, between the the beam dump or the, our flash radiation station and this, uh, this column, which you might think is not really an issue, but it turned out that this was the, um, the path to the watchman station. So this is not like, it's in a, in a, in a way similar like a clinical clinic when there is you know, a number of last men, last men out buttons in the, in the hole, but this is a hole that's probably 100 meters long. So there's a certain path, dedicated path that the CNSC approved where the, um, person who is the last in the room has to walk through and hit all these uh, watchman button to make sure that nobody's locked in the room. I will not tell you why this is. You can only imagine why this is such a strict requirement and what possibly could have happened at Triumph at some point. Uh, but basically we were told like, no, this actually doesn't, is not going to work. And basically you cannot install your equipment. So it was a little bit of a shocker uh, that happened probably in, uh, February this year, about a week before we were going to go to the last final approval to be able to install this equipment. So Luca, uh, who is a UBC student uh, working on this project, and Nolan, who is my student at UVic, were freaking out and uh, we're trying to figure out how we can change this uh, setup so that we can still walk in between our irradiation station and this column. So they redesigned the, the support for the shielding door. They said, okay, there's a lot of slack in these cable. we can, cables, so we can move these cables, you know, zip tie them a little closer. And if we do all these things, this is where our shielding door will end. Uh, so Luca actually ran to Triumph one night to be able to measure if we actually have this 30 centimeter clearance that we needed to be able for the CNSC to say, okay, this is okay, you guys can install your system. So it turns out that shoe size number 12 in the US is exactly one foot or 30 centimeters. So he measured and was able to you know, show us or convince us and others at Triumph that if we redesign the support system for the shielding door, we'll be able to go ahead with our simulation, uh, with our installations. So it was a, a little bit of uh, an excitement uh, trying to find this uh, 30 centimeter space. But we finally got the final approval and we'll be starting installation and dosimetry, hopefully you know, in the next month or so. Okay, so while we are trying to find this uh, 30 centimeters of space in Canada, people in China were actually able to do what we have been trying to do for two, two years here. 
So they uh, at the at, in Chengdu at the superconducting Linux on the Porter um, experiment, and they were able to build a an irradiation targets again electron to photon converter out of tungsten. But they did something quite smart. They actually uh, used a rotating target, so they don't have to worry about the heat deposition as much as we do. Similarly to X-ray tubes with rotating anodes. And they're able to irradiate small animals um, and show demonstrate the flash effect uh, with a six uh, MV photon beams. They ran their machine at 10 uh, milliamps and they were able to achieve dose rates up to a thousand gray per second or about 50 gray per second at 15 centimeters depth. So this is their setup. They were able to measure the dose with a fast current transformer and also scintillators. Uh, you can see the dose rate uh, with high frequencies, uh, with fast acquisition speeds um, on the plot F. They also built a Monte Carlo model in Giant of their system and validated it with uh, ABT3 measurements. And you can see the dose um, distributions at different depths here in panel H. So this is very exciting. The most exciting thing um, is um, that they actually were able to observe the flash effect I also should uh, note that this is on, only published on bioarchives that has not been peer reviewed yet. So these are some of the results uh, for tumor irradiations of uh, two different doses, 18 gray of flash in blue and 15 gray uh, of conventional in red. And you see the survivals as well. Um, interestingly enough, the survival curves for flash and conventional irradiations uh, cross. Um, so it was on breast cancer models. And uh, they've also looked at uh, normal tissue toxicity. So let's focus on this survival curves only. Uh, for thorax irradiations of 30 gray flash, they see so higher survival than 24 conventional. And for abdominal irradiations for 15 gray flash and 20, 12 gray conventional, they saw similar survival. And I suppose after the fact, they thought about um, using the same strain of mice, bulb C mouse mice, as they used for their um, tumor models. And they delivered the same doses uh, during conven for conventional radiation therapy, uh, 30 gray, and for flash radiation therapy, same for the abdominal irradiations, except for 12 gray. And they were able to see increased survival uh, after flash radiation compared to conventional irradiation. So this is, uh, again, not peer-reviewed, uh, but this is very positive that the flash effect has been observed with high-energy photons. So this would be for the first time ever. And while we are even bothering with uh, X-ray beams, of course, most of radiation therapy is delivered with high-energy X-ray beams. And you know, while flash has been shown mostly with electrons, this is not useful for uh, deep-seated tumors. This might be useful for um, uh, surface or skin skin cancers, but not for superficial tumors. So uh, not for deep-seated tumors. So we need to be uh, trying to come up with some way to deliver flash radiation therapy, if this proves to be uh, the modality of, of choice uh, to deep seated tumors. And I have here focused on X-ray beams, but there's also proton beams that I have not uh, talked about at all. So I'm just briefly going to talk about what actually matters in flash radiation therapy. Well, the answer is we actually don't know what matters, um, but there are a number of parameters in terms of the beam properties that we can look at. And that would be uh, the intra-pulse dose rate, so the do dose per pulse, or the mean dose rate, which is uh, uh, the dose rate, um, the total dose delivered by total times. It also could be the dose per pulse, which is about one milligray in conventional radiation therapy, but could be up to higher than one gray in flash radiation therapy. People are also thinking about maybe it's the total irradiation time that could be, should perhaps be less than 200 milliseconds or the total delivered dose. It's also um, a, a parameter that people are looking into. So again, we don't really know what this is. Of course, uh, for some of the beams that I've talked about, we are looking at uh, continuous beams. Uh, so the intrapulse dose rate and mean dose rates would be the same for the two machines. Um, so um, this is a plot that shows uh, the uh, number of different um, systems that can deliver ultra high dose rates. This is a, a plot that in which I am showing the instantaneous dose rate uh, as a function of mean dose rate for, for the different electron beams. 
Uh, so you see that there's the electa and virion uh, sources, kinetron or iatron are the first sources that uh, blood radiation therapy has been shown on. There's also some uh, experimental sources such as the ELBA and LCT and RELD lines. And of course, the um, plots that will be lying on this uh, dash dotted line are, um, are the machines that are delivering continuous beams because the instantaneous dose rate equals the mean dose rate. So these are electron sources. Now you've got photon sources, the X-ray tube that I've talked about, and the two uh, synchrotron sources, and uh, also some proton sources here, uh, such as the variant IBA and Medion probe, uh, probe and the snake probe uh, in Germany. So what I think was is interesting is if you look at the um, systems on which the flash effect was shown, you can see that this is, of course, the kinetron or electron machines, the very and LINAC, but also the two proton beam lines and the SRF beam line that deliver, if not continuous, then quasi-continuous beam. And that, to me, somewhat suggests that maybe it's not the dose per pulse that matters, because you know this is the, this dose per pulse, uh, is, there's no concept of that in continuous beams. And again, this is still an open question, and we don't know the answer to that. But um, but it is somewhat intriguing that perhaps continuous beams uh, would be sufficient. So here I'm very briefly going to talk about possible explanations on flash, and I'm just going to be focusing on one, which is uh, the oxygen depletion, which was um, basically thought as uh, the cause at first that it would be. Uh, the fact that when we deliver radiation really, really fast or in the ultra, ultra fast fashion, we are depleting oxygen in both normal and tumor tissues. But in normal tissues, um, when we deplete oxygen, uh, we are basically getting uh, less radiation um, sensitivity and these tissues are now more radio resistant. And of course, this also happens in tumor tissues, but they're already hypoxic to start with. So the uh, relative effect is much lower uh, in tumor tissue than it is in uh, normal tissue. Later on, uh, Christopher Peterson published like, yeah, you know, that might be the case, but it only for a certain uh, tissues, so only for certain oxygen tension tissues. It's not going to be the same uh, for all, all tissues. Uh, late last year at the Very High Energy Electron Workshop at CERN, Velko Grill presented, well, actually, no, it's probably not uh, the oxygen depletion because the oxygen depletion is very similar for uh, conventional flash radiation therapy. And uh, just uh, in April, I guess two months ago now, the Dartmouth group presented a study and we said, no, it's actually not the oxygen depletion at all. So this is still an open question. There have been other publications and uh, that are talking about oxygen depletion, and we still really don't know what the um, what is the radiobiological mechanism that causes the flash effect that means the normal tissue toxicity after ultra high dose rate radiation. So is flash a mystery? I would say yes, it still is a mystery, and uh, we all kind of have known that I believe, um, and uh, this is highlighted by. Um, the paper by Sunil Krishnan that came out of MD Anderson in which they uh, looked at um, normal tissue sparing in cardiac and splinting models of lymphopenia and gastrointestinal syndrome after a dose rate of uh, 35 grade per second and they saw no differences. And of course you can argue, well, this is not 40 grade per second, but the flash effect was shown at 37 gray per second with a synchrotron beam with X-rays. So the question is, you know, do two gray per second make a difference? Does the model make a difference? Do the doses make a difference? So there's a lot of questions that we have. And I think there is quite a bit of skepticism in the community as well. And I'm just gonna uh, show you some of the quotes that I have received from uh, some of my colleagues. First one is, flash is interesting. It doesn't quite do what we want it to. Sometimes things show differences, others don't very confusing and very difficult to make it tell a consistent story. Second one, my beef with flash is that many groups have seen negative data, but they aren't publishing it. And the third one from a radiation oncologist, flash delivery sounds scary. I will certainly not be an early adopter of the technique. And so I you know, I think we need to be very careful about uh, running flash experiments. And if you remember at the beginning of the talk, I was presenting and this conversion of a LINAC for the delivery of uh, flash or ultra high dose rate radiation therapy using a very young LINAC that was presented by the Dartmouth group. And uh, about two months or a month and a half after that, very uh, wrote a response to this uh, paper 
and basically told people not to do it or not to do this conversion lightly because this could cause equipment damage or degradation that could result in patient mistreatment. So I think we do need to be very careful how we even study flash radiation therapy, let alone its adoption. And with this, I would like to present my last slide and to mention that flash or faster is not always better. And some of you might recognize this uh, plane, uh, which is the Concorde, the first commercial supersonic plane that was taking passengers from Europe to North America in less than three hours. It was a very convenient way to travel between the two continents, but it was very expensive. And uh, there was uh, you know, everything was going well for the Concorde until the year of 2000 when the Concorde um, hit something on the run runway while taking off from Charles de Gaulle and caught on fire and all the passengers and crew on the, uh, on the plane died. It was partially you know, responsible for the fact that the Concorde stopped flying in 2004. So I wanna make sure that uh, I urge the community to not create a Concorde of radiation therapy by adopting flash radiation therapy too soon in the clinic. And with this, I would like to thank my students, Nolan, Daniel, and Alex, and Luca Egariti from UBC, my other collaborators, sources of funding, and I would like to thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions.